talks and we like to get together with people and and have a just lovely background look at what it is they do. Our guest today is the senior editor and host of The Agenda with Steve Bacon. He's received honorary doctorates from McMaster, Victoria, Laurentian and York universities and honorary diplomas from Humber, Centennial, Mohawk and Fanshawe colleges. He was appointed Chancellor of Laurentian University in Sudbury. And in December, 2013, he was made Officer of the Order of Canada and invested into the Order of Ontario. Tag on to that author of eight books, multiple award-winning documentaries, sports fanatic and family guy, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Pakin. I'll never live up to any of that, Nancy. <laughs> you put the pressure on now. How am I Very gonna follow sorry, that? Steve. But welcome. I just want to tell our, our viewers this interview has been a few years in the making. Uh, I originally wanted to get the agenda that you guys were doing remote shows across Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I wanted you to come into the Museum of Dufferin and do a show. And you said, that sounds great. Let's talk about it. So my boss, Daryl, and I came down to meet you for a coffee. Mm -hmm. And bless him, he did not get a word in edgewise. Because you and I started <laughs> debating about rural versus urban and, you know, afterward, I said to him, I have to interview this man. <laughs> so here you are. And thank you for joining us. Not at all. I'm happy to be here. But I, I never like to think of it as rural versus urban. I always yes. like to think of it as rural and urban, because I, I think there's a lot of Ontarians who've got a foot in each camp. And I, I prefer that as opposed to us knocking heads together. I very much agreed. Um, we support each other. I think. Here, here. With, with everything. Um, right off the bat, I, I would like to quote one of your 103,800 Twitter followers. Hmm. They say, I think that I should get a degree after watching the agenda for many years. Bachelor of Expanded Knowledge. <laughs> no kidding. <That> sounds <laughs> <Right>? okay. <laughs> I know there's staff. They call you Looch, but... Um, <laughs> you should explain they, that. Yes, they... they explain help. why. They help with the show content. But really, you are responsible for getting multi-million news stories a day condensed, getting those questions, getting those guests five days a week. Well, Nancy, you're, you're, bur you're burying the lead here. They call okay. me Looch <laughs> because it is a takeoff on that old soap opera star, Susan Lucci. Yes, who was nominated, I think, 23 times so for times. Best Actress in a Soap Opera before finally winning her Emmy. Yes. And I am, I'm 0 for 11. So <laughs> I got a long way to go before I actually catch up to Susan Lucci. But, um, but it's an honor to be nominated, I will say Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And, you and you're very gracious about it. <laughs> well, some, what, else, what else can one be but, uh, yeah. but grateful to be noticed? Absolutely. Now, TV hosts are supposed to be the face of the station with respect to station mandate and policy. And you told Bob Ray that you're not allowed to have a point of view. Have that you ever not wanted to just come out and, and have your point of view? The answer is um, yes and no. The yes part, because like any other citizen, when there's something I care a lot about and I may have a view on it, I'd like to be able to articulate that mm -hmm. as anybody else can. Uh, but I can't because chances are it would be about an issue that's controversial. And if it's an issue that's controversial, chances are we're going to discuss it on television. Right. And if we do, then I have to be seen as an honest broker on the subject uh, without a foot in any particular camp. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I kind of cozy up to the line a little bit when it comes to sports. They will let me get away with the fact that even though we have two, and you could argue three, National Hockey League teams in Ontario, Ottawa Senators, Toronto Maple Leafs, and there's a lot of people in southwestern Ontario who, who cheer for the D Detroit Red Wings. Mm -hmm. I'm a Leaf fan, and I'm biased for the Leafs, and I don't care who knows it. And I would say the same thing about the Canadian football. You know, I know there's a team in Ottawa. I know there's a team in Toronto but I'm from Hamilton and I've been a Ticat fan all my life. And so I'm biased to the Ticats. They let me get away with that kind of stuff, but anything sort of controversial and newsy, no. So I keep my P's and Q's to myself. Well, that's understandable. I mean, it is a publicly funded station. Yes. And, and you know, the, the taxpayers are paying for it. So you have to be kind of unbiased. <laughs> so, I agree. I agree. Yeah. 
And so um, sometimes when people like you ask me, is it hard not to express your opinions? I say, not in the slightest because I like my job and I want to keep it. You're very professional, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Try. But alternatively, mm -hmm. have you ever been presented with a guest who opinion you just did not like? Did not like. Well, put it this way. I remember we had, and I probably shouldn't out the guy, but I remember we had a municipal politician from, let's just say, north of Toronto okay. on the show one time. And we were having a discussion, I think, about planning issues or housing issues or something like that. And this municipal politician listened to one of the other people on the broadcast and then said, well, that person may have the facts on her side, but here's what I think. Mm -hmm. And I remember at that moment interrupting and saying, well, wait a second. If, if this person has the facts on her side, then it's kind of case closed, isn't it? Like, I don't mm -hmm. know what you're going to come back with, but if, if you're going to try arguing not facts, <laughs> if you're going to try arguing like phony, <laughs> yes. non-facts, uh, I'm not exactly sure what, what you're advancing here because the program we do is all about empirically provable facts. Right. And I didn't mean to be a smart aleck in saying that. I just thought we live in, I guess, what a lot of people, Nancy, call a post-truth era. Very much so. It doesn't really matter what the facts are. If I believe this and I feel it in my bones and it doesn't matter if all the facts are against me, I'm, I'm entitled to that belief. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, I guess technically you are. The charter says you're allowed to think whatever you want. But, but as we try to get to increased social cohesion, increased agreement on facts, increased understanding of how to solve problems, I think it would be useful if we sort of argued on the facts as opposed to what I feel, regardless of whether it's based in reality or not. That's all I was trying to say. It's very rare because most TV hosts do state their opinions and get involved in the debate, but it's amazing. That's why I love the agenda. It's just such a great show. Well, thank you. Um, I was watching, speaking of uh, not liking someone's opinion, um, <laughs> your independent, the independent Randy Hillier. Oh, yes. And others about potential Trumpism in Canada. We know there's a large contingent of racists in Canada and have been since the dawn of the nation. But I'm curious, do you have hope that public will ever make the distinction between factual versus conspiracy, inclusivity versus hate? Is, is there hope here, Steve? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, you couldn't get out of bed every day if you didn't have hope. So at mm. the very least, you have to have hope. Uh, I think if we, and again, I'm going to nudge very close to the line here and hopefully not go over it, but I think you can make an argument that the last four years in the United States have been a very interesting experiment in, in sort of post-truth, right. lie as much as you like, get away with it, see where it goes, don't worry if nothing you say makes any sense or is particularly mm -hmm. rooted in facts. And uh, while there is a substantial support base for that particular point of view for a bunch of reasons, and we can talk about that if you want. Um, I do note that, that 81, men, 81 million people voted for the guy who won as opposed to 74 million people who voted for the guy who lost. So I would call that, uh, and this is not a partisan comment, but I would just say it's encouraging to me that you cannot break every single democratic guardrail that's there for a good reason mm -hmm. and get reelected. I find that an interesting development. Yeah. So I'll just say that. But 74 million people. Well, 74 million people, Nancy, voted for him for a bunch of different reasons. There's no doubt some of them are neck deep in QAnon and conspiracy theories and craziness and wackiness. And I don't doubt that that is part of his base. I also don't doubt that a lot of people voted for Donald Trump because they thought, you know what, the Democratic Party that purports to be for the working man and woman uh, isn't anymore. And mm -hmm. they spend too much time cozying up to coastal elites and hanging out in Hollywood. I, I'll never forget this quote. Somebody, somebody who I think who lived in Alabama, and I just read this quote in a newspaper at some point, said, I was a Democrat my whole life, but I'm giving the Republican Party, yes, under Trump, a chance now because I got the feeling the Democratic Party was more interested in hanging out with Steven Spielberg than listening to me about my problems. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a real thing. And, and you know, pe people cannot say there are 74 million uh, 
evil, racist, uh, fact denying, climate change denying, et cetera, et cetera, who voted for Trump, because I just don't buy that. There are people who voted for Donald Trump for a lot of very legitimate reasons, including mm -hmm. not liking what the other party had on offer, mm -hmm. um, including, including a, a presidential candidate who you know, talked tough on China, which a lot of Americans wanted to hear. You know, a presidential candidate who, even though his personal conduct was disgraceful, uh, talked a good game on, on pro-life and abortion issues, which is a very important issue to some people. So, you know, there are a lot of people who want to have a lot of guns. Uh, again, they would have voted for Trump because that's a big issue for them. So, you know, we can't, it's not as neat and clean as to say there's 74 million racists in America and they all came out for Trump. No, it's, it's more complicated than that. Is that right? The life seductive call of politics. I get it. I get that. It is seductive. Hmm. And in your second book, In the Dark Side, you explore the fascinating lives of those who choose to enter the public service, whatever the cost. Is it safe to say the higher the office, the more the media becomes the publicist for the politician? Oh, I don't like that word publicist because okay. I don't think the media acts as a publicist for, the, for any politicians. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me put let me put it this way: If media and journalism are doing their jobs properly, they are not publicists for anybody. Right now, there can be opinion columnists who write in newspapers or who give commentaries on television or the radio mm -hmm. who are allowed to say what they think, and if they truly believe in a particular politician and want to quote unquote be a publicist for that politician, that's that's fine and that's different. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I think the job that we have is obviously to hold politicians to account, mm -hmm. to make them justify the decisions they make. I, I always, shouldn't say always, I often, when we have politicians on the agenda, remind the audience, even before I've asked the first question, I often say something like, now just a reminder to the audience, my job here today is not to beat up the person sitting opposite me. My job is to ask the questions to better understand why they've made the decisions that they've made. And if you mm -hmm. don't like those decisions, obviously you're entitled to your own opinion. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not here to be the critic. I am here to inquire. And I think that, you know, I think that's consistent with TVO's brand. That's what we're about. Yeah. We are, we are not yeah. part of the food fight. You know, we are part of hopefully trying to understand and educate better. So I like, I, I, I like that fit. I, I think, you know, your show and, and station is one of the, the uh, anomalies of all of this because, goodness, conflict of interest cases between media and politicians and politicians and politicians. Why is no one acknowledging or reprimanding for these conflict of interest cases these days? Well, again, you say no one, and I'm going to I'm going to push back on that because I yeah. wrote a column about this last week. In fact, yeah, and I presume you're asking this question because it has emerged in the last few weeks that uh, the Premier of Ontario's Director of Communications is in a serious, I presume, mutually loving relationship with a member yes. of the press gallery, um, a columnist for the Toronto Sun, mm -hmm. and and. Um, this is going to sound strange what I'm about to say, but it's kind of true. When you've covered politics as long, for example, as I have, or when you've been in politics as long as some of the people who are in it today have been, it's not unusual that A, there are going to be relationships formed, or B, that there are going to be conflicts of interest that take place. Sure. That's not the issue in my mind. The issue is, are you open about it? Do you declare it? Uh, I remember 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, not quite, uh, my wife was uh, director of policy for the then Ontario Minister of Health, uh, Tony Clement. And every time Tony Clement came on TVO to do an interview with me, I would start every interview by saying, let's just in the interest of full disclosure, say right off the top, who's your director of policy? He would say it, the viewers would then know it. And off to the races, we go and we do the interview. That's how you deal with those things. You can't, you can't, I mean, I'm 60. You can't live in Ontario for 60 years. You can't cover as many politicians as I have. You can't have covered as many elections as I have without ever being in an apparent conflict of interest, as I was when my wife got a job working for the Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. All you can do is be open about it and declare it. And um, now, whether those, whether the two people we talked about at the beginning of this have done that, 
Mm -hmm. People can make their own judgments about whether they have. Right. Um, you know, I presume it's a bit of a story because a lot of people out there don't think they have. Right. You've had the opportunity to get to know the leaders on a more personal level than the public. The public sees them on TV or read about them in newspapers, but unfortunately they also base their opinion on that coverage. Mm -hmm. in, in your mind, what politicians were scrutinized unfairly? I think it's fair to say that all of them at some point along the way received unfair scrutiny. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's also accurate to say that along the way, uh, they all got you know, positive articles that they probably didn't entirely deserve. Mm -hmm. I'm not smart enough to know whether or not it all balances out in the end, but, but I'm not, I, I, I just don't think I'm in the camp of a lot of people who seem to think that if you're a conservative, you automatically are going to run into more trouble than if you're a liberal or a new Democrat or a green. Mm -hmm. I just don't buy it. I've just seen like, um, I mean, does anybody in this country remember Paul Martin? Do they remember the sponsorship scandal? Yes. Uh, do they remember Dalton McGuinty and the gas plants issue? And, yes, sir. And, you know, and the orange uh, crisis. Um, I mean, those were liberal politicians and the media absolutely crucified them on those issues. So this notion that somehow if you're a liberal, you get a free pass on anything. Do we remember Kathleen Wynne? Correct. Do we remember the scrutiny that her government uh, sustained from media to the point where, uh, you know, she ended up leading the liberals to the worst election outcome in their history in 2018? So this notion that somehow media pick on conservatives more than they pick on liberals, mm -hmm. I just don't see, the, I, I don't see the evidence of it. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the media are equal opportunity offenders. I really don't think they've got a dog in the, I mean, it, the, editorially, editorially, the Toronto Sun can come out for the conservatives every time we get that. Sure. The Toronto Star can come out for the liberals edit, every time editorially, we get that. But the actual reporting, the people who are supposed to, with neutral eyes, with, with fairness of thought, report on things, I just, I just don't think that they pick on one side more than the other. I think they're equal opportunity offenders. Your family is highly involved in politics. And this is from liberal activism, municipal politics, federal politics. And Romer asked you on 105.9, the region radio interview the other day, mm -hmm. but I wanted our viewers to hear your answer to this. Is there ever going to be a prime minister Pakin? Um, well, it's not going to be me if there is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have no idea. Let's put it this way. Obviously, I love politics. I followed it for a long time. I've reported sure. on it. I've written books on it, as you pointed out. And I guess it's a form of child abuse in as much as over the course of the years that my kids have been around, uh, I've dragged them to political events and, and you know, uh, parades and campaign events. And, and uh, you know, some of that stuff rubs off. And as a result, I have an older son who's a member of the Liberal Party of Canada, my oldest. I have a second born who's a New Democrat. I have a third born who I think who at one time worked on Christine Elliott's leadership campaign when he was 12. So he was a conservative then. I'm pretty sure he's a communist today. <laughs> and, and I've got a fourth uh, who's uh, knocked on doors for Greens and Tories and Liberals. Um, so... Um, I think, I think that's great. You know, they're, they're, they're interested in politics. They're involved. They're engaged. They seem to be interested in some of the people and the issues. And uh, if any of them eventually put their name on a ballot, great. If they don't, okay. But, um, but at least they're aware of politics and they're aware of, I think, their responsibilities to sort of engage in the issues of the day, however they see fit. Your family dinner parties must be exceptional. <laughs> conversation well we haven't had any in a long time i can tell oh. you and we know who we can blame for that yeah thank you covid uh, yes exactly mm -hmm. your son zach has mastered the content too you've said he has a gift for assimilating and regurgitating key facts numbers and issues okay <laughs> so with a that? brain you said that well who did i say that to oh, i mean gosh. it's true but it's uh, <laughs> i'm wondering where you got that from yeah <laughs> So I want to know with brains like yours and Zach's, and it, it sounds like the rest of your family are, are uh, intelligent folk. What do you guys do to relax? How do you, how do you shut the brain down? Oh, well, I mean, I think you saw, and I'll, 
I guess I can put it up here again. Put it up. Okay. That's what there I do to relax. Uh, <laughs> I love sports. Um, uh, I became a Boston Red Sox fan in 1975. So before the Blue Jays were born. And I like the Jays, but I love the Sox. And I probably watch 150 Red Sox games every year. You know, I might miss a dozen along the way. Uh, you know, when I'm preparing for the next day's show right here in my office in the attic of my home, um, you know, here's my laptop right here and the ball game is on and it's just on while I'm doing my work. Uh, and then the Leaf game will be on the TV over there. So it's very often the case that I'm watching two games at once while I'm doing my prep. And um, here's, here's a really ironic story. I'm not sure I've told anybody this before, but okay, there's four kids. The third kid's name is Teddy Robinson Pakin. And he's named that after Ted Williams, whose picture you just saw, the greatest hitter of all time, left fielder for the Red Sox from 39 to 60. And his middle name is Robinson because the year he, whoops, that's my dinger. I better turn that off. Do you the need year to he was that, born. Steve? No, 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 no. It's just uh, the year Teddy was born. It was the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson's breaking the color barrier in baseball. Mm -hmm. So we gave him Robinson as a middle name. Teddy Robinson Pakin. He is the, I guess I can say this. He's got the best name of any of my kids. And he's the only one who's not a sports fan at all. You're Couldn't kidding. care less about sports. Really? He wasted the best name on a kid who just doesn't <laughs> care or appreciate it. Uh, but yes, we've done that. I mean, I, I, uh, we again, before COVID, we'd take a baseball road trip every year, me and my dad and as many kids as we could get to come along. Um, sports for us, and I guess I blame my parents because they certainly got me into it, mm -hmm. um, Sports for us is the way that the Pakins for generations have hung out and enjoyed each other's company. Wonderful. And, um, and again, until pandemic, um, my brother and I have taken my mother to opening day almost every year. My mother hit every opening day Blue Jay game ever. She's been ah. to every single one until pandemic. Yeah. And either my brother or I would take her. My mom and dad and my brother and I, the four of us, again, pre-pandemic, used to go to opening day for the Leafs every year. That was the one game we would all go to still. I mean, we went to lots when we were kids, but this is the one we still go to. And it was, it was our excuse to chill and to be with one another and enjoy one another's companies. And, and uh, yeah, it's a nice, just that's our tradition. And Manitoulin Island. Well, that I inherited from my wife. My wife's from Sudbury. And, you know, when you, when you live in Sudbury, uh, your camp, not cottage, because it's Northern <laughs> Ontario, so your camp uh, is in Manitoulin Island, which is only a couple hours drive away. Um, and so I, I married into that very wonderful tradition, and we love it there so much that, oh, it's beautiful. that um, um, we got our own place right next door to my in-laws. So it's, it's a really, and I like her family, so it's a really nice thing that we're all... <laughs> able to sort of be up there together uh, in the summers. And just yeah. watching the Northern lights dancing and the sand dune beaches. It's just it's glorious. Beauty. It's yeah. Yeah. Absolutely glorious. I, uh, that place and Fenway park are my two favorite places in the whole world. I envision your family sitting around the living room and you break out Sinatra and the kids <laughs> know the words. They do because home. they've had, um, Ever since, ever since they were in my arms, my giving them a bottle, singing Frank to them, they, yeah, of course, yeah, they, they know Frank's work for sure. Have they ever, when you've, you've pulled out something new you're, you're into, have they ever gone, dad, really? <laughs> well, here's the thing, Nancy, we're at the point now where I'm learning more from them because of right. course my musical tastes are kind of stuck from maybe 35, 40 years ago and back. And I kind of stopped following music a bit after that. And, and, and they are, they not only know my music, but of course they know their own music as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to catch up to Taylor Swift and Post Malone and I don't oh, know, God. Who, who else is out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's terrific. I'm just a uh, uh, Dua it's Lipa. not Sinatra. <laughs> uh, nobody's Frank. Nobody's Frank. Nobody's Frank, oh, but oh, Frank. Oh, oh. What was the last concert you went to? The last concert I went to. 
That's a hard question to answer because I'm not sure I even remember. I know the last concert I was supposed to go to. And that was last year, last summer, my brother bought tickets for him and me to go see Billy Joel at Bill Stadium in Buffalo. And he got good tickets because it was my 60th birthday. So it was a really nice gift. And of course, that concert didn't happen. And they rescheduled it for this summer. And I got a feeling it's not going to happen this summer either. But that's, that's the last concert I should have gone to. I think the last one I probably did go to was probably two or three years ago, Neil Diamond at the, uh, I don't know if it was the Scotiabank Arena or it was still Air Canada Center at that point, but I got probably Neil Diamond. What yeah. Puts on. I brought my mom to a Neil Diamond. Wow. Yeah. Now that's a rock concert. If you just mean concert period, full stop, Toronto Symphony Orchestra at Thompson Hall would have been the last one. Fantastic. And that would have been in uh, two Junes ago. Fantastic. Uh, or one June ago. I can't remember. Two Junes ago. Yeah. yeah Peter Lundgren's last concert. It's hard to distinguish, eh? Last year. And it totally getting... is. Yeah. Totally lost track of time. I totally, yes. I think, and yeah. I hear that from so many people as well. They, yeah. can't, they can't keep track of time anymore. That's so true. No, yeah. interesting. Um, during an Algonquin College Waterfront Campus interview, you said that not much keeps you up at night. You don't get a lot of sleep, but not much keeps you up but you worry all day long. What do you worry about, Steve? Worry, uh, I, did I say worry? Cause I'm yeah. not sure, I did, eh? Yeah. I'm not sure worry is the right word. I just have, there's a lot of stuff going on in my head all the time because the kind of work that I do requires clear headed decisiveness all day long. Yes. And so a good night's sleep is kind of important to me. Mm -hmm. um, every time I do an interview and you're, experiencing this right now. Uh, you, have to make, you have to make decisions every 30 seconds. You have to just say, now, uh, I'm listening to what he's saying. Do I want to follow up on what he's saying? Or do I have a question on my sheet here? Do I want to go to that next? And maybe I have a producer who's texting me some advice on my device because they want me to pursue something else as well. So there are all these decisions that you're constantly having to, to weigh in the course of doing an interview. And I write columns as well, and I do reporting on Twitter, mm -hmm. and you know I do a podcast as well with John Michael McGrath. It's called the On Poly Podcast, uh, in which we review the week that was at uh, the Ontario Legislature and in provincial yes. affairs. So th it it's constant. It's it's just constant content creation and decision making required. So there's just a lot going on in my head all the time. I guess is what I'm saying, and. Um, I think we know that, but <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to keep up, I guess, is what I'm saying. My uh, a dear family friend was Tom Mooney, who was assistant coach for the Hamilton Tie Cats. Oh, okay. Up in 72. Huh. My dad was uh, the president of the Martliff Foundation of McGill. So that's how we, because Tom was with McGill football team prior. So we were at every game, but my family's sports hero was Boston Red Sox, Carl Yastrzemski. Oh, yes. I saw Yaz play. That was oh. one of the great experiences of my life to be able to say that I saw Carl Yastrzemski play. I think Carl Yastrzemski is the one professional athlete of any sport who played the longest yeah. for only one team. 23 seasons, all 23. with the Boston Red Sox. And of yeah. course, he was a legend. Yeah. Carl was a legend. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have been able to to say that I watched him play at Fenway Park. He retired at 42, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, long, long time. He had a great, um, he had a great run. You said, I quote, I did my master's in broadcast journalism at Boston University because it was the closest post-secondary <laughs> institution to Fenway, to Fenway Park. Park that yeah. would have me. So Fe I, let's talk Fenway. You mentioned it earlier. 40 years your family has been going to Fenway. Fenway. More. When you walk in, what's the feeling? I do it every time and it never disappoints. You walk in through the tunnel, which are very narrow. Remember this park was built in 1912. So yeah. it's very old. It's shoehorned into a neighborhood corner, Kenmore Square. And as you walk through the tunnel and get to the end of the tunnel and you emerge and you see this field of green with this enormous green monster wall in left field and the beautiful red seats 
and you know that the greatest players in the history, you know, Babe Ruth played here, you know, the greatest players in the history of the game have played here, you know, the history that has taken place there. And my heart just starts thumping out of my chest. It's just an incredible experience. Yes, I became a Red Sox fan in 1975. They went to the World Series and lost that year. Uh, it would be another 30 years, <clears throat> excuse me, of following the Sox before I could enjoy watching them win the World Series. It was worth the wait. 30 years or more. 1975 to 2004. Yeah, 30-ish years, almost 30 years. So um, it's, it, yeah. So I wanted to go to do my master's in journalism at Boston University because I wanted to go to a lot of Red Sox games as well. And not every year, but almost every year, certainly not this past year and probably not this year. Uh, I've um, managed to get back to Fenway Park for a road trip uh, just to watch them play. My mother and I went when I turned 50. So I guess that's 10 years ago, mm -hmm. 11 years ago. Um, my 50th birthday, she and I went down and we watched, uh, we watched uh, the Phillies and the Red Sox for a series. I think Doc wow. Halliday actually pitched for the Phillies that weekend. Cool. And I saw something that has only happened twice in major league history happened that, that game, that weekend, a guy named Daniel Nava walked up to the plate for his first at bat in the major leagues with the bases loaded and on his first pitch hit a grand slam home run. Wow. That's only happened twice in 150 years of major league baseball. And I'm just like, I'm the kind of guy who gets turned on by being able to say, and I was there and I saw it. So yeah, that kind of stuff is pretty cool. Okay, here's your cliche question of the day. What's the toughest interview? And don't say Steve Pakin versus Steve Pakin. <laughs> that was a little uncomfortable, Steve. <laughs> and I know Mordecai Richler, but also I want you to tell people about Gorbachev. Okay. Okay. So a bunch of things there. Number one, the Pagan versus Pagan was a cute little thing they put together. It was it was an attempt to publicize a book I'd written. Yeah. So the idea was Pagan's going to interview Pagan about his new book, and 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 one Pagan Pagan the guest walks off the show because Pagan awesome. the host is such an idiot. <laughs> so that's that. Yes. Uh, Mordecai Richler to this day is still I think the hardest and least satisfying and most disappointing interview I've ever done. That was in my second year I think at TVO for a show I used to do called Studio Two. Um, I think Mr. Richler just didn't want to be there. I think he yeah. was publicizing a book that he just didn't love. And I think he just didn't want to be there that day. And all the answers were one and two and three word answers. And I oh, couldn't get so anything out of him. Yep. And I could feel the flop sweat. And, and just as an indication of how bad this interview was, the format of the show back then was do the interview. Interview's over. I say, thank you very much. Director cuts to a wide shot, kills the mics. And we sit there and lip flap for five seconds and then fade to black. And on that occasion, when they cut to the wide shot, uh, Mordecai was so anxious to get out of there. He ripped his microphone off and walked off in the middle of the wide shot. He couldn't wait another five seconds for the oh interview to be over. So that was not a good interview. Mikhail Gorbachev, on the other hand, was amazing. And th just the feeling you get being mm. in a room with somebody and talking to them who has changed the world, mm -hmm. the whole world, mm -hmm. that is something. Uh, now, you know, he spoke Russian, I spoke English, we had to go through a translator. So obviously the attempt to sort of create some chemistry between us is difficult when you're doing that. Yeah. But still it's a- um, It's Gorbachev. <laughs> it's, Gor it's Mikhail Gorbachev who changed the world. Yes. Wow. That's memorable. Eh? Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite? Uh, Nancy, it's like asking me which one is my favorite child. It's impossible <laughs> to do. Just impossible to do. Or maybe the answer is, I hope the one I do on Monday will be my favorite. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk about your film, one of your films, in the 1993 documentary, Return to the Warsaw mm. Ghetto. Brilliant. You won the Silver Screen Award at the U.S. International Film and Video Festival. You received awards at the Yorkton Film Festival in Saskatchewan and at China's Shanghai Film Festival. And for people to know, it was based on, on April 19th, 1993, thousands of Jewish people from all over the world gathered in Warsaw to observe the 50th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, one of the few truly heroic events for them during World War II. Many were survivors of the ghetto returning for the first time since the war. 
So Steve, uh, let's step aside from the awards, which is incredible, and, and the survivors' emotional responses, which must have been very difficult. But I'd like to know for you personally, how, did, how was the journey? How was that journey for you? Well, it was just an honor to be in their company. Let's start with that. Uh, you had the parents who were survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto and just 20 seconds of history here. You know, when the Nazis took over Poland, they essentially built a ghetto in the middle of Warsaw in which they, they jammed like sardines the Jewish population of, of the city and, and environs and essentially cut it off um, uh, the idea was obviously to destroy the Jewish population. And, you know, people tried to smuggle in food and medicine, but essentially it was, it was impossible. It'd be basically like dropping the city of Hamilton into, you know, half a square mile. I mean, it was just, it, it was it, inhumane conditions to say the least. And, uh, and, and the idea was to, to destroy everybody who lived in there. So the, the parents were people who somehow survived all of that. And on this occasion, the 50th anniversary, they returned to Warsaw to basically show their children um, where and how they grew up. And, and I was the fly on the wall. Uh, my camera crew and I just went. We did interviews ahead of time and after the fact. And then while we were there, we just watched. And we watched how these families you know, some of them, I know one woman, for example, um, had gone back since the end of the war, probably 20 times, wow. because she was saved by a, a Catholic family in Poland. And she went back to, to see her every year and to bring her supplies and, and so on. And then there were other families who had never been back and whose kids had never been back and whose kids had, had no, not no, but not very much understanding of what their parents had gone through. So this was a revelation uh, for, for some of them as well. And, and I, just, I just considered it a tremendous honor yes. that they had enough confidence in me and our team to allow us to essentially eavesdrop on, on what was one of the most powerful, emotional, um, I mean, use whatever adjective you want, uh, moments of their family life. And, um, and we made this documentary, Return to the Warsaw Ghetto, and, uh, you know, I'm glad it's there yes. um, in perpetuity for people to see. It. Highly recommend it. Which one of your offerings, your documentaries, your books, uh, the show, um, what, what are you most proud of? Uh, what, none of it, actually. I wouldn't say I'm <laughs> proud of any of it. No, that's I, not I don't, the answer I want to hear. <laughs> no, but again, that's, that's, um, that's, that's not what motivates me. And it's not the word I would use to describe any of it. I do it because I love doing it. I do it because I hope it makes some kind of modest contribution to people's better understanding the issues that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say I'm proud of any of it. It's, it's out there, it's done, and people can decide for themselves whether it's worth anything. Uh, I think the joy of working at TVO has been that I've managed to work for people who understand that, that I am a person who loves hosting the agenda, loves it, but who feels capable of doing more than that. And they have given me permission to do more than that. And that's really wonderful. I'm very grateful for that. So yes, I host the agenda, but I'm also writing columns for the website. And we have a new arrangement with the Toronto Star, whereby I do a bi-weekly column for the Star, and then we do a show every second week on some angle related to democracy. It's called the Democracy Agenda. So we've got that going too. I mentioned I do a podcast on Ontario politics. I've done, been you know, lucky enough to moderate, I think, seven leaders' debates during election campaigns over the years. Uh, you mentioned one documentary I've done. I've done a few more besides that as well. The books I've written. I mean, none of this would have been possible if I'd worked at a more traditionally thinking place. Um, you know, they'd say, your job is to host the show and that's all you get to do. But I think TVO has understood that I'm better at what I do as it relates to the television show when I can do all these other things as well, because yes. it just gives me energy and 
juice and, and, and introduces me to people and issues that I can then bring back to the, to the television program. So that's, that's just good fortune. And, and that's good fortune to be working with people who, who get me. So I'm glad about that. I'm in that same position. Great team of people who just let me do what I need to do. <laughs> so, and we, and we, right. never take, we never take it for granted, do we? No. No, you can't. No. no. Yeah. <laughs> Your wife uh, is, was very involved. Um, and, and is still a lobbyist, is she not, for the healthcare system in Canada? I, I, th- I think she would quibble with the word, but, but yes, she, yes, she has her own business uh, with a, a, a business partner. Uh, they are health policy consultants. Mm-hmm. Uh, when stakeholders in the healthcare business uh, want to get stuff done, um, she's one of the people, I guess, they call to try and get policy changes made. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're Sunnybrook Hospital and you want to get a new wing built, uh, you might call my wife and say, we're going to need your help lobbying, if you like that word. Okay. Lobbying yeah. government to try to make the case for why we need a new wing on Sunnybrook Hospital. So right. that's the kind of work she does. So I'm sure the healthcare discussions and, and that at your home is another <laughs> great conversation. You know, it's, it's funny, Nancy, they're not, they're not really discussions. And I say that because first of all, she knows 10 times more about it than I do. <laughs> and, and second of all, and this will, will harken back to the conversation we had earlier about conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to put up some pretty tall walls between us when it comes to our professional lives. And so it is often the case that she, do, she doesn't know some of the stuff that I'm up to. And I don't know some of the stuff that she's up to. And while, of course, we talk about our professional lives a little bit, um, you know, she doesn't spill. <laughs> and, uh, and I've had scoops on stuff that deal with healthcare, and I don't spill either. Sure. You know, she can find out about it on TV like everybody else. Uh, you know, and I will walk into a room at some point, and I will hear her on the phone talking to somebody, and then she will say something like, um, uh, okay, Marilee, good to talk to you again, and, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, she's on the phone with the Minister of Long-Term Care. Yes. In the middle of a nursing home crisis. Okay. I, uh, um, okay. I would like to ask her a hundred questions about that, but I know I'm not going to get anywhere. So I'm not going to, okay. and that's the nature of that. Right. But here we are, here we are at this very time in a lockdown again. Yeah. And, and I, I do notice you are somewhat frustrated by, by the healthcare system and what's been going on, but is it the healthcare system or is it the politics? The short answer is, I don't know. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, let me put it this way. I note with interest. I just nearly, I merely note of with interest that um, every single party that has been in power since this pandemic hit, that has gone to the people for reelection has been reelected. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I know that there there is a lot of complaining out there about mistakes that have been made in the healthcare system. And, you know, have we procured supply quickly enough? Clearly we haven't. Have we rolled out um, the vaccination of our populations as quickly and as effectively as we ought to have? Clearly we haven't. You know, there's lots of blame to go around and lots of problems to discuss. Having said that, you know, for whatever reason, Canadians in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick. Uh, I'm probably forgetting one along the way somewhere, Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm -hmm. And we'll see, there's probably gonna be a federal election later this year. We'll see if the trend continues. Uh, All of those parties that were in power got reelected. So it may well be that the electorate has decided in its wisdom that um, they may not love everything that the party in power is doing, but they may not think that the parties in opposition would have been any better. Right. I don't know. Right. I don't know. So yeah, sure. There's lots to complain about and sure. Lots of in, <laughs> been incompetence, uh, you know, every day of the week, no mm-hmm. doubt. Could the other parties have done any better? I don't know. Maybe they could have, maybe they mm-hmm. couldn't have. I don't know. Okay. This has been an amazing chat and we really haven't debated too much, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Would you want to? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm happy to debate Red Sox versus Yankees with you anytime you want. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Steve can be found on TVO's The Agenda, which is aired Monday to Friday at 8 and 11 p.m. He can also be found at S. Paken on Twitter, tweeting whilst watching sports, <laughs> and Facebook slash The Agenda and TVO.org The Agenda. Thank you, Steve. For Nancy, that was a pleasure. And continued good health for your family. And for the rest of us, please keep inspiring and informing our brains. <laughs> I would appreciate that very much. And thank you to our viewers who have joined us. Now, I think we all need to get outside for a beautiful walk in the summer day. Thank you, Steve, very much. Pleasure. That was, that was a lot less painful than I thought it was going to be. So oh, thank you. Oh, 